to provide you with some information and um, some easy to use proven financial tools that uh, we've been using with SPMS for quite some time now to help you budget your way back from COVID in, in the shortest possible time. Now, I don't know how long that time will be for each one of you, but um, you know, it's going to, and it's going to be different for every one of you as well. Um, so um, what the four elements that we're really looking to do is you know, to help improve your knowledge, um, understanding that most people fail because of what they don't know rather than what they do know. Uh, we're going to try and you know, give you some new skills that you can apply um, because application of new skills is the only way to get improved results. You're not going to get the same results from doing the same things over and over and over again. Um, you know, using some proven tools, you know, as we say, you know, why reinvent the wheel when it's already there? And lastly, um, you know, to help prepare you, um, you know, for your futures and understanding that your future as well as mine and everybody else's is determined by both what we think and what we do. And, you know, hopefully this will give you some insights of things that, you know, you can use to you know, choose wisely to, uh, to move on. So what we're going to be talking about today is ensuring financial viability. Um, you know, why am I talking to you today? Um, very simply, as Ross said, my name is Anthony Turner. I've been with the mentoring service from since 2006. I've been a business coach. I, I teach and have trained in um, all sorts of uh, small business uh, topics, including basic, you know, the basics of finances and everything else. So I'm not an accountant, so I'm not going to be talking to you from that perspective. But I'm just going to be talking to you as a as a business person and a mentor of business people based on some common pragmatic stuff that I've designed, but also that uh, you know, we've learned over many, many years that we've found to be uh, working for uh, small businesses across the country in a multitude of different environments, including um, the aftermath of um, disasters like the bushfires and floods and stuff like that, and now uh, the pandemic as well. So you know, the first thing I think about um, you know, when we start talking about finances, is that, you know, is to ask yourself the question, you know, how much money do you want to make? Um, most of us have got some ideas, you know, as, 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 as much as we would probably like to make or could make, uh, but are we clear about, you know, how much money it is that we want to make? And if you're unsure about, you know, what sort of money you should be making in the you know, business that you're in, I would suggest, you know, that probably the first and one of the easiest things to do is to, um, you know, have a think about you know what you would be worth if you went to work for somebody else. Now, for some of you who've been in business for you know a long, long period of time, um, you may not know what that answer is. But you know things like Fair Work Australia have got you know um, and the AC, um, the ATO have got sort of guidelines and you know benchmarkers and all those sorts of things where you can get an idea of you know what your roles are. So particularly Fair Work with all of the awards. Um, they've got, you know, awards for all sorts of things and guidelines, you know, for salaries, etc. So, you know, certainly get an idea of what you're worth, but also think about, you know, and, and particularly if you're an employer, then, you know, how much are you paying your staff? And ask yourself the question is, you know, are you taking home the same amount of money? Now, there's probably many reasons, um, and hey, I've been guilty of it, and I think every small business owner has been guilty of it, is, you know, falling into the traps of paying yourself last, and hopefully there's some money over at the end of the day or the week or the month um, to enable you to take home some pay to pay your own bills. Um, but today, today, what I really would like to do is try and give you some ideas about doing things a bit differently and about putting yourself first, because realistically, you know, any of you who, like me, have at times been frightened of my letterbox um, because you're not sure which bills are coming on and where the hell, where the, hell the money is going to come from to pay them. You know, it's... Um, it's, it's pretty scary to be there and it can be pretty lonely and pretty, pretty stressful as well. And what we're hoping to do is, you know, recognising that the COVID uh, response and recovery is going to be challenging um, to get, you know, uh, business uh, sales levels up um, and profits back up to what they may have been in 2019. Um, then, you know, what we really need is some sort of you know, formula and some tools to be able to make that really work. So, first off, before we get into the actual physical stuff about budgeting, I want to have a, a think. You know, have a think about you know the key ways in which you can actually grow your business because every one of us um, has been impacted 
um, by COVID in some way. Some of us have been able to work through COVID in restricted or different ways. And some of the people who have been able to do that have actually thrived in that process. Um, and you know, good luck to them because they've been, had the ability to adapt to online formats um, and move product that way, or they've chosen different ways of doing things, or they've found new audiences. So yeah, good luck to them. Uh, however, I think it's fair to say that the majority of business owners you know, have been hit and hit hard um, based on you know, ongoing expenses with you know, 80, 90% drops in their incomes. So there's four key ways that I know of um, to business. So the first one of those is to increase your profit percentage. So, you know, I think, you know, it's fair to say that, you know, the key way to increase your profit percentage is to charge more um, and buy lower. So that's how you increase your profit percentage. So a lot of us are very hesitant um, and scared about increasing prices, particularly at this particular point in time. We think we've got to go out there and keep our prices low or even lower our prices to um, get people coming back through the door. I think it's a false um, premise um, and it's one that I would certainly encourage you to you know, forget about um, and to really think carefully about. And the reason I say that is if you look back over the history of your business, then there's going to be a large number of you who have been in this competitive mindset for quite some period of time and possibly haven't um, you know, increased your prices um, over that period of time. A couple of people have just joined, so if you wouldn't mind uh, muting your uh, microphones, I'd really appreciate it. So think about how you're going to increase your profits. So increasing your profits fundamentally comes, you know, price increases one of those things. Um, certainly um, look at you know, what's going in on in the market, look at what some of your unique selling points are and the unique things that you do in your business that can enable you to charge a little bit more. There may be um, you know, ways in which you can increase the value of your sale. Um, so there might be things that you know, currently, you know, I did some work with a hairdressing business at one stage, uh, for example, a lady's hairdresser, and she always did a, you know, an eyebrow wax and a tint and things like that as part of her service. And she never charged any more. She just did that as an added value for her customers when they did a, you know, a hair colour or a perm or something like that. Um, but that thing that she was giving away had a value. So, you know, you can think about, you know, the things that you add into your package, but you don't want them to make, you, you want to put enough in there for people to know that they're getting increased value, but you don't want it to be so much that they're at, you're actually giving away the opportunity for profit and for sales within your business as well. Now, it's going to be different, of course, for service-based businesses versus um, you know, product-based businesses. In service-based businesses, you, know, you might be giving free, out free newsletters to you know, increase the value or something. Um, you know, there's a variety of different tools, and I would suggest, you know, if you haven't done so already, you know, get the advice of a mentor or somebody who you can sit down and look at your personal circumstances and look at how do you um, improve your pricing, improve, um, you know, the sales frequencies, how do you increase the sales value, you know, maybe some of you need to be thinking about, you know, and I remember when my wife and I had a, a gift shop in the Yarra Valley, um, you know, we used to do little things in, like increasing the sales value. We would sell um, locally um, packaged teas um, and, you know, we would create packs with a, a you know, a mug, um, a tea strainer and uh, the loose leaf teas. So all of a sudden, instead of the sales value being for a pack of tea, say five bucks or something like that, all of a sudden we kick that up to a $20 sale by including these other things um, in a package and selling those things together you know so have a think about you know your products your services what things are complementary to one another that you can sort of put together in some way so that you can increase the sales value you know we all know about the mcdonald's version you know do you want fries or do you want to drink with that or do you want a dessert or whatever it might be you know the reality is it's easier to increase a sales value 
than it is to actually get a new customer. And the reason is that that customer is there buying. Now, they're not always going to say yes to whatever it is that you're looking to package together and offer them. Um, you know, but the reality is it gives you an opportunity to increase each of those sales value. It's because the people are already in a buying mode. You don't have to try and convince them to buy something. They're already doing it. So, you know, if you're a cafe, you know, do you throw a cookie in, you know, would you like a cookie or a cake or a, a muffin or something to go with your coffee? You know, if you're selling a meal, do you want a coffee to go with that? You know, turn it the other way around. Think about, you know, how you can add things that you do that naturally complement one another to increase the value of each sale and therefore the value of each customer. The other one is to increase, you know, which I skipped over is the increasing the sales frequency. So what that really is about is how can you actually get people to come back more often? Um, now, you know, we all see in supermarkets like, you know, we've heard on the news in the not too distant recent future, um, things like chocolate bars and stuff like that. They're actually shrinking in size, but the price stays the same. Now, that's a way of increasing profit but it's also a way of increasing sales frequency because people are getting less, so they're going to come back more often. Now, I'm not saying that you should do that um, or that necessarily that that is ethical, but the thing about it is, is that within each of your businesses, there are things that are common, often used, that you can sell more of, or you can then start linking that to go from step A to step B to step C to step, step D. Now, the last one in terms of growing your business, and we're talking about the, the funding of your business, not just your business as a whole, um, is to decrease your expenses. And we'll talk a bit more um, about that as we go through the budgeting stuff in a few minutes. But there are a couple of caveats on decreasing expenses. Um, the first and foremost of those is that, you know, when you're looking at decreasing expenses, look at the reasonable and the real expenses that you can decrease. These are, and these are typically the things that you're not using, you don't necessarily need anymore that you might have you know, signed up for. Subscriptions is probably a great example of that. Okay. Many of us subscribe to, um, to newsletters, to you know, maybe professional associations, and we've, we're not just in one, which is our main one, we're in two or three. Um, it could be, you know, um, subscriptions to, you know, Netflix at the office or something like that. Why do you need that up there? Why, you know, why wouldn't you have that at home, um, but not necessarily the office? You're not going to be sitting there watching TV during the day. So there's all sorts of things, and I would suggest, you know, it could be subscriptions to, um, and often they're two dollars, five dollar things. You know, it could be um, software that you're paying on a monthly basis. You've got a subscription to, but you use it just like once a year. Sometimes with those things, you know, you might be better off to pay the fee to actually use as you go rather than have a subscription in place. You know, we did this exercise with a couple of different businesses um, recently, and we saved you know some of those businesses, you know, thirty, forty, fifty, even up to a couple of hundred dollars a month. Now that's all money off the bottom line and when times are tough you need all of those things um, i remember in my own business you know it was a few years ago when voice over voip voice over internet um came first came in as distinct from phone calls and i, I reduced my phone bill um, by hundreds of dollars a month um, simply by going to voip phone as distinct from this the standard telstra line um, you know, there are other expenses that, you know, you can maybe look at, you know, do you need to be getting the absolute Rolls Royce best of everything, you know, other things that are less value, you know, are you hiring, um, you know, people to come in to do work when you can might be able to go to Airtasker or Fiverr or something like that and get tasks done as you need them to do rather than having the ongoing costs. Now, obviously, the key thing about decreasing expenses is whilst that sounds like good common sense, particularly when times are tough, there is a very, very important caveat on all of that. And the caveat is very simply this, and that is you never decrease expenses when it is going to decrease the value of what it is that you sell or provide. I'll give you an example. You know, we've probably all been to a new restaurant as once it's opened. And, you know, that restaurant, um, you know, first time you go there, they've got, you know, 
reasonable size plate. It's nice and full. The food's really fresh, and it's you know it's really really yummy. You think, wow, that's really good. I'll go back and I'll take some friends. And you might go back there two or three months later, and you think, mm, I'm not sure that that's as good as what I remember it to be. Um, you know, maybe they're just having an off night. But then you go back another two or three months later with some other people or just yourself, and you think, wow, there's a lot more source and substance on the plate this time. You know, it's not there. Now, what's typically happened is that once they, some businesses, once they get you in, in the beginning, they think that you're going to stay there and they can get away with doing all this stuff, which is actually decreasing the value, which is the reasons why you went there in the first place. So it's really, really important. If you're going to be decreasing expenses, you cannot decrease the value of the customer experience. You're better to charge more and keep that experience high than to decrease that experience and have customers walk to walk away. Now, I know one of the things that we talk about in one of our marketing seminars um, was that you know, certainly people, you know, 60% of customers who are quite satisfied with what they got don't come back to your businesses. And the reason that is because they don't feel valued. And decreasing the value of what you offer your customers is very, very important um, in terms of a big, big turnaround for pushing your customers away. So it's really, really important to remember that you know if you're going to decrease experience, uh, expenses, the first question you've got to ask is, does it decrease my customer experience? Because if it is, if it does, then there may not be a value judgment. If it's something that you can reduce the cost of, you know, maybe you can get a better deal on finance. Maybe you can get a better deal, um, a decrease in your rent. Maybe you can get a better you know, deal on your, on your phone system or something like that where it's actually saving you money, but it's not decreasing the value experience or the customer experience. By all means, go for it. But if it's going to hit the customer experience, I'd suggest you know, do so with warning. Okay, so now I want to start talking about budget. Now, I'm not going to ask the question because I'll probably get a whole heap of no's. Uh, and, but the question really is, who likes to do budgets? And the reality is not many people. Um, the accountants love it. Um, those people who you know, are really into the numbers, you know, and not necessarily enjoy doing it, but they know the value of doing it. Uh, but I think particularly now, it is absolutely essential for every business to do a budget for their business for the next 12 months. Um, and I think it's really important, you know, to be when you're doing your budget, to start considering a couple of things. Now, the first thing it's really important to consider, and particularly of those of you who are sole traders um, or, you know, family businesses, you're going to have to really think about what your family expenses are. Um, and I, you know, I know a lot of people have been you know, having to, you know, trim the cloth a bit fine these days because of you know reduced incomes and uh, all sorts of things. Um, so you know, and a lot of people have done this by necessity of you know, reevaluated their costs of living. But I would suggest you know it would be very very beneficial for you to do a, a home budget. Because at the end of the day, you know, what you're looking to do is to do the same as for your business. You're looking for all of the things that might be, you know, you might have Netflix, Stan and Disney, um, you know, um, subscriptions, you know, going for your TV to keep everybody, you know, entertained. But, you know, can you do with one or, you know, can you vary, you know, vary them rather than paying $30 a month, pay, you know, $10 a month, you know, and keep some entertainment going. You know, look at all of the different things about your family expenses. Think about the school you know, if you've got kids, you know, think about things like, you know, dining out or you're eating out or, you know, your Uber Eats and all of these things, you know. I know personally it's a lot cheaper to um, cook yourself um, and maybe even get some cooking lessons than it is to actually eating, be eating out all the time. So it's really, really important to understand how much money your family needs looking at all of the things like, you know, your car, um, phones, your housing, uh, education, self and kids, um, entertainment, um, and all of the different elements of home expenses to work out how much money you need to be bringing in to be able to cover all of your expenses and save a little bit. 
Now, quite a lot of you are going to be in partnership arrangements where there is more than one um, income generator within the household. And that's great. That means that, you know, if you've got a partner who's earning reasonable money, that means there's less pressure on your business to provide you with a wage. However, it is still essential, I believe, to be setting your business up with a view about the wages that you are going to require. And I'll touch on this a little bit more um, when I show you a short video about how we look at budgeting. Okay, so that's about family expenses. So, you know, once again, streamline wherever you can. Think about what's really necessary um, and, you know, take some of the pressure off financially at home if you possibly can. The next thing is to do the same thing, uh, you know, with your business expenses. Now, a lot of your business expenses, you are not going to be able to, you know, put aside. And some of the business expenses that you might consider putting aside are probably ones that you is not the best thing to put aside. So an example of that might be some marketing expenses. You know, you might be considering, oh, you know, I won't market and everything else because, you know, I don't have much money coming in. But sometimes it's actually better to, you know, strip down some of the bare bones things that you need. You know, do you need to buy a new Christmas tree for the shop this year? Do you need to buy um, a, uh, do you have to do, you know, new sign writing or things like that? Can you make do with what you've got? You know, do you have to do, you know, a lot of, um, marketing, you know, as in advertising and newspapers and things like that. Maybe you don't need to do that. Maybe you have to be smarter about how you use your marketing dollars to be able to connect with your existing customers or your past customers to bring those up to date. Do you put some advertising, you know, behind AdWords or, you know, into Facebook or Instagram campaigns or things like that to actually, you know, connect with the people that are most important, you know, to your customers. So you can spend less, but you still need to spend some. But it's a case of sitting back and really rationalising all of your business expenses and looking at, you know, what is necessary um, and many things will be necessary. You've got to keep those things. You've got to have a somewhere to work from. You know, if you're working from home and you've had an office in the past, maybe this is the time, you know, and you've got some struggling about paying rent or something, else, maybe this is the way that you look at do you need an office going forward or something like that. And I'm not su suggesting that you get out of your office if you need it. You know, obviously not. Um, but there are other ways, co-working spaces and you know, working from home and things like that, which people are starting to accept as the norm, in inverted commas, because of the COVID shutdowns we've had over the last few months, um, to actually start looking at, well, how am I going to do business differently? Because if you start thinking about that as part of your overall plan, financial plan, you might find there are savings and things that you can do you know, within your business expenses. Other things like I've touched on before, which you know, relook at you know, all of your, you know, your telephony bills. You know, can you get a better deal? You know, do you have an unlimited data plan you know, when you're only using 20 gigs or you know, 10 gigs a month? Maybe you can save a lot of money by you know, having a, a different plan for your phones. Um, Maybe you can bundle things and you know get things different, you know, and more and less expensively in an overall sense. So it's really, really important to you know have a bit of a think about all of your business expenses and how you can actually manage those, which ones are essential that you've got to keep, which ones you would like to keep that you can park and then maybe restart again when the money's flowing better. And which ones actually don't you need at all that you can actually, you know, sign out of those? I mean, are you paying for 10 different website names and you're only using one? You know, little things like that. So there's a whole lot of stuff. But once again, I would suggest, you know, get some advice, get some mentoring support, whatever it may be. Talk to a business advisor, talk to the, the team at the Economic Development at Melbourne City Council, you know, to get some help in sort of, you know, evaluating all of this stuff. Okay, so now I'm going to play a little video. Um, now, I'll apologise in front. The, it was taken in a, a sort of a fairly a big room. It's got a bit echoey. It sounds a little bit tinny, um, but I think you know, you'll find that it uh, works well. So sit back. It goes for about six minutes, but this will give you an idea about a budgeting process that we use um, and that I'd suggest might be beneficial to you. Now, if you've got a problem hearing it or anything, uh, please just pop a note in the chat box so that I can see it is, and then I can make some alterations.
Hi, my name is Anthony Turner. I'm a business coach. I've been working since 2003, helping people start their business or grow their business. Now, one of the fundamental issues that nearly every business owner faces from time to time is the one about cash flow. All right? So it's about, do I have enough money coming in to pay the bills, you know, meet the wages, or otherwise it could be, do I have sufficient funds coming through my business to actually grow my business and take it to the next level? Now, typically, most business owners have done some sort of uh, cash flow or budget predictions. And typically what they look like is something like this on the board here. We've got a categories column on this side, we've got a total column in there, we've got all of our months that go across in the middle there. Now most of the standard tools work from income at the top, listing all the income with a total. Then there's the expenses with all the various, various, various expenses with a total down the bottom here. And then last of all, there's a column here which says plus or minus. Did I make money or did I not make money within a particular month or over the course of the year? Now this tool, I believe, is great to analyse what has happened in your business. But I actually don't think it's the best way to actually determine what you need to happen to take your business to the level that you want and to be able to decide the income that you require to make your business successful. So what I've done is a couple of small changes. So let's rub these out on the side end. What I tend to do with my business owners is I start with the expenses. You know, most of us have got a handle on what our expenses are and understand how much money has to go out of our business on a day-by-day -day basis. So there's all the different levels and levels and levels of expenses. And these will be things like you know, motor vehicles, advertising, promotion, wages, staff, um, all of those different things, except stock. I'll come to the stock in a moment. Now, I mentioned wages before. This is a very important one. If you're like many business owners, wages is something that you tend to take out when the money is available. Now, lots of small business owners are guilty of doing this, and hey, put my hand up, been guilty of doing it myself. So the question is, to make your business successful and to understand how much money that you have to have to for your business successful, it's really important we plan to actually take a regular wage. Now, there's a couple of ways to do of determining what that wage is. The first one of those is to create a family budget. Go through all of your family expenses and come up with an amount of money which is the things that are directly related to your family, which is outside of your business. So once you've actually got your family budget, put that amount in on your wages line. Okay. The other thing is if you're not sure about what that is, or if that seems fairly low, then I would suggest have a look at your business, have a look at the role that you perform in it, and work, find out how much it would cost you to actually hire somebody to do your job. Because if you know what that is, put that in on the wages line. Right? Also remember to add on the things like superannuation and those other things as well, because they, you want that as well as everybody else. So once you've got all the wages in there, then you've actually added all those up and you've got a total here, which is the amount of money of your expenses. Now, the next thing you have to do is to think about, well, I'm looking to grow my business, so I need to earn more money than just what's required to cover those expenses. So what I suggest we do is we add 20% as a minimum, you know, and if you're a service business, it'll be higher, product-based business, it could be 20%, profit to grow your business. Okay, I'll come back to why 20% in a minute. Now, once you've got all your total of your expenses, you add on the 20%, what do you then have is your income target. Now, if you're a service-based business, you can stop here, right? but I would suggest that you increase this amount to 20%, uh, as higher than 20%, okay? So, typically, my business, I run on about 45 to 50% as a service business. Now, why 20% you might ask? Well, it's very, very simple. What I've come to realize with working with you know, hundreds, probably two or 3,000 small businesses, is that those that have a target typically will achieve between 90 and 120% of the target. Conversely, those without a target typically only achieve between 50 and 80% of what they require. So just look at these in numbers for a moment. Let's say your expenses were 100. 
at 20 percent that's 100 plus 20 so your total is 120. Now if you've got 90 percent of that 120 minus 12 which is taking away 10 percent you've still got 108 which is eight grand more than the hundred that you require to make your business go. Now I mentioned this stops here for a service-based business. If you're a product-based business, so like a retail shop, then uh, what you have to do is you've got to add on the value of the cost of goods. So that you can do either by a standard gross margin that you use or a real value of cost of goods. So whatever it is, add the cost of goods value onto the income target and that gives you your sales target. Then all you've got to do is you divide your sales target or your income target depending on whether you're a product or a service business, divide it by the number of, you know, the value of your average sale. And that will tell you how many clients you have to see for this business to work and to be profitable. That's my tip for today. Okay, so I did get a message about the a bit of uh, lack of sync of the uh, frame rates, uh, so I apologise for that. Um, I'm not sure whether that's it seemed to be flowing frequent uh, fine at my end, um, and I only got the ones. So I'm not sure whether that's buffering at yours. So. I trust that you got the gist of what that was all talking about. Um, and if there's any questions about it, please feel free to pop that in the chat box now. Um, just uh, And I'm more than happy to respond to, to that. So I'll just give it a moment for anybody to pop something in there. If there is a, a question on that or comment. Okay, so nothing coming through. So I, well, I'll, I'll move on. And one of the things you saw from the video is that at the end of that um, uh, equation um, of you know, whether it was the income target or whether it was the sales target, what that did give you is a break-even amount. In fact, the break-even amount is actually the expenses. So without the 20% on top of it. Now, I used to run a service business and I used to run my service business on a 40%. Um, uh, profit for growth um, uh, rather than a 20%. And I, I recommend that most service-based businesses do do that. Um, so uh, what sales target, I've got a message, what sales target would you set for different industries? Actually, I mean, profit percentage, it really comes down to profit standards. And I would look at the um, ATO benchmarks as being something that can guide you on what the profits are uh, by industry. So once, now that we've actually got a budget in place and it's broken down and we understand what our basic expenses are, um, we then have a break-even amount. That's the actual amount of money that you have to make for your business to at least break even. Now, the reality is what we know to be true with those numbers is that when people understand what their target numbers are, typically they will get between 90 and 120% of those. And that's just a psychological thing that we, um, once we know what we're going for, we tend to go for it and we, we actually get it. And we start you know, monitor and we think about you know, how we're doing it. Are we on track with it? And we can put in tools to manage it and monitor it. Um, if we don't know what that number is, what I find happens from all of the hundreds of businesses that I've worked with is that people who don't, don't know what their tar income targets are typically only get between about 50 and 80% of what they actually require. And the first thing that goes out of the window is their own wages. So I think it's absolutely essential that every one of us you know, does a budget tool um, and then puts it together. Now, you know, we have a cash flow tool, a cash flow forecasting template, which actually looks like this, which is actually all set up. Um, and, you know, if, I know Ross, um, when he speaks to you at the end of the session, will be more than happy to make this available um, to people that have been on the session as well. So you don't have to try and create. This is a tool that's already there. So this particular tool takes you, gives you an idea of all the different expenses. You don't have to use them all. Um, but you know, the thing about cash flow is that it's one thing to work out a budget, which is how much money you need to generate. 
The next thing is that you've got to understand that there is a lag between when you spend the money and when you get the money you know, in so to actually sell. So using our shop as an example, um, you know, we would have to go to sort of like, you know, in August, uh, we would be going to the trade fairs and we'd be spending money to buy goods that we weren't going to see a return on um, until Christmas time. So there was about three or four you know, months where I'm actually paying money out uh, to actually uh, buy stock um, for delivery uh, to sell at Christmas time. And I had to carry, carry the value of that. So with service-based business, oftentimes, you know, we'll be doing services um, and then billing people and there might be a delay in them paying. So, you know, we've got to sort of work out our cash flow. So this particular template is to design to actually help you look at that. And then what you do at the bottom is that you start putting in your income. Once you've actually understood, you know, from the video that I showed you before, you know, that was working out how much money you need. Now you've got to start working out well, when's, where's that money going to come from and when is it going to come in so that you can make sure that everything marries up. And, uh, you know, it might mean that you've got to invest some money. It might mean you need some credit. Um, it might mean you have an overdraft. Um, you know, whatever it might be, there are ways that you can use to actually manage your cash flow. But you need to know and plan for when that money is going to be required so you can work around it and understand what you're going to do. So this is a tool that can help you do that. So the other thing I would suggest that, you know, in terms of planning your cash flow is to really, really be having a think about, you know, creating some sort of a graph um, about your sales month by month by month. So this was something that, you know, um, we did for a particular business. Um, and, you know, we looked at it. So theirs was a, a normal financial year. So one was July and 12 was June um, as the months along the bottom. And they had small sales, you know, sort of, you know, between, you know, like, you know, five and $25,000 a month, you know, depending on what month it was. Now, this was a retail business. Um, and you can see uh, December, high peaks, so, you know, Christmas trading, that sort of stuff. Um, and this wasn't my business. This was another business. Um, but, yeah, you can essentially see the different, you know, the way that, you know, these businesses operated. Okay. So I would suggest it's easy to do. It's all as a matter is, is, you know, getting an Excel spreadsheet. Or if you're using things like, you know, MYOB, zero or one of the other um, accounting type packages, you know, look at how you transfer that data across into, you know, graph format so you can actually see your sales. And so you can actually see the trends um, of your business and understanding the trends of your business will help you with actually managing and the finances of your business. Next thing is about getting your pricing right. Now, I touched on pricing a little bit earlier uh, when I was speaking about the, um, you know, increasing your prices. Oftentimes, we haven't done it. You know, pricing is very, very critical, you know, to get your business. You've got to understand what your costs are. You know, you've got to understand. And this is not just the cost of goods if you're reselling them. It's also about understanding what it costs you to run your business and, apportion and apportioning an amount of those overheads to the products or services that you sell. So, you know, pricing is very, very important and possibly something you might need some advice with. Some of you will probably be very, very good at it. But, you know, fundamentally, knowing what your core profit margins are on if you're buying goods in, um, applying that over the top of your expenses and factoring all of your expenses from your budget will actually help you determine what the right pricing is for the products or services that you're selling. And if you're finding that you're, you know, you've got to sell higher than somebody else, Rather than just competing to the bottom, I think it'd be really important to start thinking about how you can do things differently. Are those products or services the right ones to be selling um, for your business? Um, if they are, how can you actually increase the value of them or decrease the expenses around them without you know, throwing away the customer experience, as I explained earlier? So there is a difference between profit margin and markup. And very simply, um, you know, it's... Um, the, the difference very simply is this, is if you, if you buy something for a dollar and you sell it for $2, you know, the markup is 100%. So you've doubled your money or the cost, but your actual profit margin is 50% of what you sell it for. Now, it's important to know that distinction because sometimes, you know, we forget that, you know, when we, 
sell something, whether that's a product or service, if we get 10 bucks for it, you know, we think, oh, wow, I've got $10 to spend. Well, in reality, you might only have $2 or $3 or $5, depending on what your profit margin is, uh, which is the bit that you get to keep. The rest of it's actually gone on the expenses of, you know, creating or, you know, buying that product um, to sell. Um, there are some certain margins. So some businesses, they will be thinking about, um, you know, um, manufacturing. Some businesses will be manufacturing. They'll be thinking of selling it through wholesalers or distributors and then retailers. You know, so, you know, we need to understand if you're going to be a manufacturing business, what the various links in the chain are going to require. And these are just guidelines that I've got on the screen here. Um, but, you know, you know, you've got to understand what the links in the chain are. So if you're going to be pricing, you're going to have to be pricing from the very outset um, at a retail price if you're the manufacturer or the wholesaler um, so that everybody in that chain is going to be able to get their cut and, so, and they're all going to be making some money. So it's just something to be thinking about when you're actually formulating your pricing. Once again, you know, don't try and work it out now. Get some help around this stuff you know, if that's what you're thinking of doing. Um, the next thing is our four bank accounts is a, is a process of managing money. Um, I would suggest you would all have a business account. Um, I would suggest you probably all got a personal account. Um, and what we suggest that you do with the four bank accounts is that you know, from your bank accounts, you create a business saver account. Now, I used to use IGA. Most of the major banks have now got these. These are on the online savers accounts where you can transfer money backwards and forwards pretty quickly. But I would you know, put aside from my business account, I would pay two ways. First is I would pay my wage to my personal account. And then from the business account, I would pay into the business saver account things like GST or uh, PAYG or you know, things like that, or the profit for growth element that I'd inbuilt into my pricing. So at the end of each week or each month, I'd make a transfer into that, into that account. And the reason for doing that is that puts that money aside. You'll get a little bit better interest. I know interest rates are not great at this particular point in time, but you, know, you will get something which will contribute. But the other thing is good is it takes that money out of your day-to-day -day transaction account for your business, and it makes you more frugal as you actually um, you know, paying your bills and the things that you buy, the services thing that you commit to. Now, the last thing is that you know, I used to run a personal saver as well, similar to the, on, the business saver, which is an online one. And I put money aside, you know, if I wanted a new car or holiday or something like that, or whatever, some repairs for the house, whatever it might be. It was just a way of actually forcing myself into saving. And what I found was, is that when I was using this sort of a system and quite deliberately, once the money comes in, dishing it out and then using the business account as the main transaction account, I actually had more money available to me to use on an ongoing basis because I'd actually hidden some of the money that I might otherwise have spent. Now, it's not always practical that you're going to be able to do that. I understand that. But you know, it's, a, it's a great little tool to use or process to use if you, know, you can have the ability to be able to do that. Put aside some of that stuff. Some of you will be very good at it. Some of you probably like me when I first started business, I'm probably terrible at it. This helped me get on track with my finances. Next thing is that, you know, is really important, I think, is for every business to create some financial key performance indicators. Now, typically, when my wife and I had the, um, you know, the gift shop, um, what we used to do is, was our average daily sales was the amount, the profit amount per sale, the uh, per sale, the you know, things like that, you know, so we could actually monitor all of our sales activity on a daily, weekly, monthly basis to make sure we were on track. And then we would input those, you know, um, the results into our budget document as well, so as we could track uh, a variation between, you know, what our target is and what um, our actuals were. So it's really, really important uh, to actually create some KPIs um, and also to understand what they are and use those as a management tool to keep you on track. See, the thing is that with the KPIs, if you know what it is and you're not meeting that KPI, you've then got to go back and have a look at it or you've got to work out you know, why it's not working for you. And then you can make some adjustments to your business. Now, I know when times are tough, we all are looking for some financial support options. Um, so, you know, you've got the federal job keeper, the job maker. Um, so these are, you know, uh, 
ones that are available federally. Um, certainly check on the uh, COVID, um, Australian Government COVID website. It'll give you links to the, the various grants and stuff that are available. Um, also check out Business Victoria. Um, they've got uh, this small business digital adaptation program that they've just launched, which is uh, up to about $1,200. Um, for implementing things like, you know, accounting systems and stuff like that. Um, there are, you know, like all grant programs, there are, you know, criteria that you've got to meet. So look at it carefully. It may or may not be right for you. Uh, for those in the um, in the hospitality industry, there's outdoor eating and entertainment grants that uh, might be applicable to you. Um, and the other one is that the third round of the business support fund from the Victorian government is about to wrap up. It's closing, you know, in five days' time. So if you haven't gone in for part three of that already, um, and you do qualify, you know, get onto it very, very quickly. So I don't really don't want to go on with much more because I, you know, it's fairly hard to digest all the information there. As uh, Ross said, he is recording this, so.